Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge, and welcome to Keeping Relevant. Jerry Goldfeder, senior counsel at Cozen O'Connor and a national expert on election and campaign finance law, joins me to talk about congressional reapportionment. The special thing this year is the number of people, or at least I think the special thing, is the number of people who are extremely interested in the outcome of New York State's congressional elections. So welcome. It's great to see you again, Ronnie. It's terrific. <laughs> Even though it's a very tough political Terrible. year. We're all in a hurry. We want these elections over and done with, yeah. and we want good results. Definitely. So uh -huh. you ask a question about the congressional elections in New York. Yeah. It's a very tight House of Representatives. The Republicans control it by very few votes. We lost that House. We lost control. The Democrats lost control of the House of Representatives because we lost all these elections in New York. New York is considered a blue state, yeah. but yet there was this red wave in uh, the last election, and we lost all these seats. Which really ran, ran counter to other places, didn't it? That's right. Yeah. That's right. It, what's interesting is Democrats did very well across the country, except, except here. in New York and California, two of the bluest states. And um, so we're trying to make up for it. And there's a new, dist there's a new um, every 10 years, there's new uh, uh, districts, and we're trying to uh, win back those seats. But we are doing it, I mean, there's been more talk across the country of challenges to congressional redistricting based on the census from 2000. Is that something I'm imagining, or is that true? No, it's true because Republican-controlled legislatures have been drawing these lines, congressional lines and state legislative lines, in a way that benefits them in, in outrageous ways. And people have had to go, advocates have had to go into court. And the Supreme Court of the United States has not been very responsive to the issue of what we call partisan gerrymandering. Obviously, in when it's a Republican-controlled state and they draw the lines that should be more or less equal Democrats and Republicans and they draw it in such a way as that many more Republicans will get elected than Democrats, it's, it's because of partisanship. And the Supreme Court has said you can't bring a case about partisanship. It's okay to use, to use a political party interests when you're drawing the line. And so Democrats are at a real disadvantage in Republican states. And mind you, there have been Democratic states who have done the same thing. Maryland is a perfect example where lines were drawn to the benefit of Democrats and Republicans were hollering about that. In fact, in New York, the happened. last time yeah. the Democrats in our state legislature redrew the lines after the census so that they were very disposed to electing as many Democrats as possible. Republicans went to court, and the, well, the highest court in New York State, the Court of Appeals, four to three, said those lines were unconstitutional because they violated various partisanship dispositions and so on. And so we had new lines this year as a result uh, of that. So. We're in some very tight elections, and both the Republicans and Democrats say that the control of the House of Representatives runs through New York. Well, who would have thought that? <laughs> it's amazing. It really is. But it reflects also what's happening in the country, right? Yes. It reflects a, a lot of things. One was Democrats um, not paying enough attention to local legislatures. That is absolutely right. Because it's the local legislatures, right. the state legislatures that draw when the did, lines. When do you think that started? Them not paying attention? Yeah. They've never paid attention. They never. They finally, the Democrats have finally started paying attention to Dean that. Dean who wanted to pay more attention? Dean wanted to do that. That's, yeah. that's very good. When, when he was DNC chair, when he was chair of the Democratic right. National Committee, he said, let's have a 50-state uh, plan right. where we will try to win as many Democratic seats in the state legislatures throughout the country. Because after all, 
it's those legislatures that draw their right. own lines, but also Set congressional lines, right. which which means the control of the House of Representatives, which means the control of, of the policy in Washington, the fate of the republic. Right. But nobody listened to Dean. It's true. He was the best. He had the best idea. That's just So that happened. And then the court system got polluted also. Polluted is one way of looking at it. They <laughs> became very partisan. The one thing Trump did, to his credit, quote unquote, is he stacked the Supreme Court of the United States. He appointed three justices, and they have been, for the most part, very conservative. And I don't mean conservative in the traditional sense, we want to conserve our institutions. I mean conservative philosophically, rendering awful decisions on the voting rights uh, law, on uh, reproductive rights, you name it. The Supreme Court of the United States has been, I'll use your word because it's a good word, has been polluted. And people have lost a great deal of faith in, in the Supreme Court of the United right. States and to such a degree that there is a real movement now to restructure the Supreme Court so that they don't serve for life, uh, that there are term limits uh, on uh, Supreme Court justices. I'm not sure that that will ever happen, but it might. It reminded me that you were um, in the attor state attorney general's office. You were in charge of the Office of Integrity. What was it called? I was special counsel to Andrew Cuomo for public integrity. In public integrity. So does public integrity require some kind of, what kind of public integrity is there that Oversees or has something to do with the Supreme Court. Well, public integrity what is generally mean? is generally understood as relating to corruption, and it's hard to define what corruption is, except you kind of know it when you see it. So, is it corrupt for Justice Clarence Thomas to sit on Trump-related cases right. when his wife? was involved in the January 6th insurrection. Right. I think there's an ethics issue there. Yeah. But the Supreme Court of the United States has, has its own set of ethics, which is minimal. And it's up to Thomas to recuse, to withdraw from a case or not. And it's not as if his colleagues can make him or anybody else could make him. So talk about losing faith in the Supreme Court. When you have a justice whose wife was involved with all these, uh, with all this conduct to, that tried to destroy the Republic, and he sits on those cases, you kind of have to wonder why his fellow justices put up with that. And, and there's no recourse. You can't impeach a member of the Supreme Court. Okay? Yes, you can. You can. Yes, you can. So who could call for that impeachment? The House of Representatives can impeach him. So we and go the back Senate to redistricting. Uh, the Senate would try him and either yeah. convict him or not, throw him out or not. So we can go back to finish the circle back to where we started with redistricting. Well, that's true in the sense that if the Democrats control the House of Representatives, right. it would be more likely that, that they might impeach they might a Supreme it. Court justice. But pretty, let's be candid heavy, about it. Heavy. It's a very heavy lift. Right. Um, to impeach anybody. Right. And, should be. Well, and, and that's true. It should be. Right. It's a kind of like a remedy of last resort right. to remove a public official not for... Not in this administration. Not in this administration because they don't... Well, it's not this administration. And, no, no, it's, it's, it's this, this con Congress. Con it's this House of Representatives that wants to impeach Biden, God knows why, impeaching the Secretary of Homeland Security with absolutely no basis. Um, they, so, they are not, they are not conservative in the traditional sense. They are radicals yeah. who are trying to not right. conserve our institutions, right. but to destroy our institutions. So what are you, you don't seem to be as hopeful, or are you hopeful? We always talk about whether we should be hopeful. Right. And you and I agree we should always we be, be hopeful. hopeful. So we do still have the value that, uh, that, um, Biden can get reelected and be the president. He will be reelected yeah. and he will be the president. Yeah. And whatever problems, whatever issues have people have with him on this policy or that policy, 
excuse me, at the end of the day, it's the way Biden says it, I think is beautiful. He says, don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. <laughs> if he came up with that line, great. Yeah. Whoever came up with that line, Very it's good. great. Yeah. But it's, it's meaningful yeah. because at the end of the day, it's Biden or Trump. Now, you'll appreciate this. I remember for those, for those people who have a real problem with Biden's policies, and so on, and want to vote for somebody else, or want to stay home. Um, in, in I don't mean to date myself, but in 1968, when it was Humphrey against Nixon, right. and there was a war raging, the Vietnam War, war against, raging in the Democratic Party, and a war raging in the Democratic Party, and the, the convention that nominated Humphrey, who never participated in a primary at all, but got the nomination after Bobby Kennedy uh, got assassinated. Um, uh, there were people who wouldn't vote for Humphrey because of his position on the war when he was vice president. Yeah. I didn't vote for Humphrey. You didn't. And the reason <laughs> I felt okay about it is because I knew, I knew New York would go for Humphrey irrespective of my vote. So it was kind of a considered judgment at, at that point. But now... If I felt that way, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take any state for granted, New York, California, any state, because we're in such a volatile uh, time that any state can go one way or the other. So every vote really does count. So we can be hopeful, but, but we need to work very hard to make sure that nobody votes for third parties, nobody stays home, and they understand the stakes that we have between Biden and Trump. And then you have to understand the Electoral College, right? You don't in order to vote. Just vote. What bothers me about the um, not voting for somebody, I mean, I, I can't believe that 7 million people who didn't vote for, for um, Trump, the difference in the votes was 7 million, right? So this 7 million people who didn't vote for, for, for Trump are going to... Vote for him now. I just don't see it. Do you? It's a different situation. Biden is now the incumbent. And yep. so people are responding to Biden as the incumbent. And the number of people will change. The number of people voting will change. Will change. The, the, the people who are voting will change. The situation, the economy is different. It, it, we're not in the throes of COVID. There's a war in in Europe, there's a war in the Middle East. So people have different things to think about when they vote. So you can't just say, look what happened last time and how could it be different this yeah, time? You don't think so. <laughs> well. And the younger people are more inclined to be not uh, loyal supporters of Biden. Is that what we're being led to believe? Well, it seems that we're being led to believe that. And, uh, I'm not sure that the media is right about that because come November 5th, when young people and old people go in and vote, the alternative is pretty clear. And even if there are real issues with the incumbent, even if there are real issue, disagreements with the incumbent, the alternative is, is someone who promises to be a dictator on day one, who promises to deport people, who promises to continue his war against the administrative agencies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So whether you're young or old, you need to recognize that. And well, well we know that when we were younger, we didn't think that uh, we should just support an incumbent because we were idealistic and a lot of the young people are idealistic. That's great. That's fine. We love it. But let's get real on November 5th. Do you feel that way in discussions about Franklin Roosevelt when they say that Roosevelt's policy to help the Jewish people could have been stronger? It could have been much stronger. There's so, no question about it. Question well, you lived during that time. What did you do about that? <laughs> I was very, I was, thank God, young. <laughs> How does that affect your thinking about Roosevelt? It gives me great pause that uh, Roosevelt 
I know this is out of left field. That's quite all right. I I'm very unhappy that he did that, yeah. that, he, that he failed to take action, right. despite the fact that he was advised in very cr concrete terms right. of what was happening in the camps in Europe. He, for whatever reason, and we'll leave it to the historians, for whatever reason, he failed to really grapple with that issue and, and assist the Jewish people who were being literally exterminated. Right. It's an and I think that's a that's a, a a bad mark on on Roosevelt and his administration. Despite all the great things that he did, that was unforgivable, as far as I'm concerned. And inexplicable, inexplicable. Well, ultimately. well, maybe yes, maybe no. Yeah. After all, he was an upstate patrician. Right. Maybe he just did not have that kind of empathy right. for the Jewish people as we yeah. think he should have had, and we hoped he had. Uh, right. But he didn't. So let's go back to the country. We really have to also say, though, that in the court system, the federal judges, in most cases, have been more responsive than the Supreme Court has been to some of these election, just you know, uh, or reapportionment things. It depends on the judge, really. Right. So we become and it's more not and more about the political backgrounds of the judges. Unfortunately, yes. I'm a person who does not like when you pick up the New York Times and it says a judge appointed by Trump, yeah. appointed by Obama, that yeah. should be irrelevant. Right. And for, for most of the judges who sit, it is irrelevant. Yeah. But for some, yeah. uh, they take that, uh, the person who appointed them, it, it, it was done for philosophical reasons, political reasons, mm -hmm. and that's who they are and that's how they make those decisions. But, but we also see that there are judges who have been appointed by Trump who have ruled against him, and that ha and that's occurred consistently. I think I was going to say, and, and to really pay proper attention, a lot of them have done that. That's and right. Been very fair. That's right. I think it's accentuated by the judge down in Florida or whatever. Her, what's her name? Cannon, I think. Yeah, who people are suspecting. What she seems to be doing is, is slow walking the case. That's something that a judge ought not to do. Now, she may have her reasons uh, that are legitimate. It doesn't look that way from, you know, a thousand miles away, uh, but she may, in fact, have uh, good reasons for the way she's managing the case. It doesn't look that way. Uh, but on the other hand, you have uh, uh, judges in Washington and the uh, Court circuit appeals. courts, the Court yeah. of Appeals, who have been pretty um, even-handed right. in their decisions, and they've been expeditious in handling their cases. And so, you know, I think it all will work out. Uh, the question is uh, whether or not there will be any trials, any of these criminal trials, before the election. Because there are a number of people who would otherwise support Trump who have said, not if he's convicted. And what he has attempted to do, and most defendants do this, is to try to delay things. And so, you know, you can't blame him for that. I mean, his goal is to delay things and delay things so that none of these trials occur before the election. He's hoping he'll get reelected, and then he'll get rid of all these cases. Could he really do that? Well, he can order the Justice Department to drop the cases relating to so what do you think the would insurrection. In the country, if he did that, if he got elected and did that. Well, you're you're asking what would happen in the country. <laughs> it would be the country that elected him. So, those <laughs> yeah. of us who didn't vote for him would be extremely upset. The but Constitution is really not protecting this extraordinary democracy that we're all talking about protecting? You know, the problem with the Constitution <laughs> is... I know I'm jumping around. That's but quite all right. The problem with the Constitution is, in, 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 in a real way, it's held together. The constitutional protections are held together by people respecting the norms of the way the constitutional provision is supposed to work. So who would have ever thought that some... Uh, uh, some candidate for president, some president who was running for re-election would say, 
No. I should stay in office and we're not going to abide by the vote and it was stolen from me. You know, we've had, we're coming up to our central election and 11 incumbents, 11 incumbent presidents lost their elections. 10 of them said, I'm not really happy, but I'm leaving town. The 11th, Trump, didn't happen. It needs to stop the process, calls a mob, and that's what the criminal trial is about, both in Washington right. and right. in Georgia. Right. I was thinking the other day about uh, Bloomberg <laughs> extending the term limits, that it would be, would it be equivalent that the House of Representatives would agree the way the city council did? and work to extend the term limits? Well, a, a president can only be in, in office, can be only be elected for two terms. That's in the Constitution now, the okay. 22nd Amendment. Right. So the only way that could change is, is through change another constitution. constitutional right. amendment. Bloomberg uh, changed term limits right. through the legal process, through the city council so, here so, in New York. <laughs> so we get to uh, states' rights, I guess, when each state is able to set its own election. Well, they can't change some things about a national election, but they can change the districts in which the candidates run. I don't, I don't. So, you know, when we started this experiment yeah. in 1787, yeah. uh, there was a lot of obviously states' rights because they were the colonies and new states and they had all their prerogatives and they were very jealous of their prerogatives. So we put in the constitutional in the constitution that the states will control their elections. The states will regulate their own elections for Congress. The states will regulate their own elections even for President of the United States. So every state has its own election code. Every state has different ballot access issues. There, every state has yeah. campaign finance laws and so on and so forth. So there there are there are all sorts of things that change that a state can do. Voter ID, you can't have water on a line when you're waiting to vote. You, uh, you, Great. you, Some crazy you things, can't, good things. you know, yeah. submit somebody else's registration form. All these things to interfere with, with elections. But states have the constitutional prerogative to do that because that's the way we set it up. And we've never had a movement to change that? Well, Congress can enact laws yeah. that supersede that and are, uh, uh, that govern the entire United States. But they do it very rarely. And when they do it, those laws get challenged, like the Voting Rights Act, which has been in existence since 1965, 64 and 65. The, the, the very important Voting Rights Act that was a result of the Civil Rights Movement and Lyndon Johnson and so on. And they've been whittling it away and the Supreme Court of the United States has really taken the teeth out of the Voting Rights Act for the most part because the conservatives who bring the cases and the courts, who the Supreme Court that rules on it has taken away this congressional override of what the states can do. So, but I'm still hopeful. Oh, good. Thank you. But in the last minute or two we have, has there been more, uh, have the, the creation of more special interest legal challenges increased? I mean, have, it seems to me there are more organizations than we used to have that bring cases to the court. There's more litigation, more well, election related litigation, litigation than ever before. Right. People go to court all the time now, right. uh, starting probably in the year 2000 after Bush v. Gore was decided by the Supreme Court. Now, it's, it's practically pro forma that Republicans will go to court, Democrats will go to court, any kind of change in the law uh, needs to be challenged or any kind of proposal that people want to be enacted, litigation ensues, and so we're litigating like crazy in the United States. Um, and sometimes, unfortunately, it's the outcome of a case that will determine who wins an election. And that's not the way it ought to be. The way it ought to be is whoever gets the most votes right. wins. And in the importance of the courts and in the, the, whole, the whole outline of our lives, basically. Right. It's all litigation. It's interesting. Well, um, 
You know, I always thought I wanted to be a lawyer, but in the recent years, I have no interest at all in being an a lawyer, especially when you start to look at what it means to interpret the Constitution and, and how you create, I mean, it's beyond. Well, we all participate in different ways. And some of us like being lawyers, some of us <laughs> like being advocates, some of us like being relevant and interview people and being on the front lines like you've been for a thousand years. Yeah. Oh, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> it's all right, you can say it, everybody knows it. But does it affect the kids, who, people who are coming to law school? It's a whole other there, thing we need to talk about. So I teach regularly at Fordham Law School. Yeah. I used to teach at Penn Law School. Yeah. But I've been at Fordham Law School now for 20 years and we have a voting rights and democracy right, project. Your head up. Yeah. Yes, and we have a lot of young people who really want to be committed. lawyers for, to try to change the system in positive ways, to expand our democracy, to protect voting rights. It's, it's terrific to see it. Well, on that great note, we say thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm.